What's up? In this video, I'm gonna show you a pretty unorthodox way for making creme brulee at home that requires no water bath. The results are outrageously rich and creamy and the amount of effort is very low. To get started, we'll need to make the custard base. So for that, I'll grab a two quart saucepan and into it add 1200 grams of heavy cream. Yes, that's a lot of heavy cream, but this recipe makes enough custard for four gigantic creme brulees. Next, I'll grab some fresh Madagascar vanilla bean. In general, for vanilla custards like ice cream, creme brulee, or creme anglaise, I think splurging for the fresh vanilla beans is worth it. That being said, plain old vanilla extract will get the job done. It's just that that custard won't have the same otherworldly ethereal vanilla vanilla quality that you get from the bean. To prep this vanilla bean for the custard, I'll carefully slice down one side from tip to tip. And by the way, I pressed this bean as flat as possible before I sliced it to make cutting it as easy as possible. Next, I'll open up the skin of the bean to reveal the inside flesh. And then using the sharp side of a paring knife, I'll scrape all the way down the bean to get as much of the paste as possible. And there we go. That's about nine bucks worth of vanilla right there. Gram for gram, the only more expensive seasoning is saffron. And it's understandable because as far as I know, just like saffron, the production of vanilla beans is super meticulous and labor intensive. Like every flower needs to be hand pollinated because the bees that pollinate them all live in Mexico, not Madagascar. Next, I'll drop this paste into the cream and then I'll drop in the bean itself for a good measure. Might as well. Then I'll move this over to the stove and drop it over medium heat. A quick stir to get the paste and bean evenly spread out, and then I'll bring this up to about 150F. We're basically making vanilla tea. I want to steep and infuse this cream with as much vanilla flavor as possible, but if we heat it too much, the aromatic compounds will start to degrade, so definitely don't boil it. From here, I'll kill the heat and let this steep for 10 minutes. While that does its thing, I'm gonna start on the egg part of this custard. For that, into a medium bowl, I'll combine 160 grams of sugar, two grams of salt, then I'll grab 10 large eggs and a little container to crack them into. That didn't work. There we go. And once I've got all 10 eggs cracked into the bowl, I'll use my fingers to separate the whites from the yolks. The move is basically to let the white fall through your fingers while cradling the yolk carefully. I much prefer this method to the Italian granny method of moving the yolk between two cracked shells because I almost always break the yolk and make a huge mess that way. And once I've got all 10 yolks in the bowl with my salt and sugar, I'll whisk everything to combine, then I'll grab my infused cream. I'll pour about half of the cream through the fine mesh strainer here and then whisk immediately to temper in that hot liquid. In goes the other half and then a quick whisk to get everything combined. Next, I'll take my custard and strain it one more time to remove any little bits of egg yolk that might have gotten cooked while I was whisking. Make sure to scrape all that vanilla into the bowl too. That's like three bucks stuck to the side. And ooh, yeah, check it out. There's some yolk stuck in there. No shame in sifting them out because it's better to have them in the strainer than in your smooth pro-level custard. We did this in the restaurant all the time. Next, I'll pour this custard into my four ramekins up to the inner edge where the lip starts. That's about 12 ounces. And if you're thinking that 12 ounces is an insane portion of creme brulee, no sweat. This recipe can also easily be split into eight six ounce portions as well. Or what if you don't has ramekins? Well, you could also make this recipe for a crowd in the same nine by 13 baking dish that you use for things like enchiladas or lasagna. Cook time for the smaller ramekins and for this baking dish listed down in the description. Next, I'll grab my little pocket butane torch and then very lightly kiss the tops of these custards to pop any bubbles left over from the pouring. No torch, no problem, just skip this step and we'll look at another method for caramelizing the sugar in just a second. Now for the weird stuff. I'm gonna wrap the top of each ramekin tightly with plastic wrap. This is the move that allows me to skip that traditional water bath method. The plastic's gonna trap the steam that the custard releases as it cooks, keeping the cooking environment nice and moist, just as if the ramekin were surrounded by water in the oven. But Bri, won't the plastic melt? Well, no. The oven temperature is right around the boiling point of water, so it won't melt. And as an added bonus, the low temperature oven will also enable a foolproof cook. Slow and low yields better set, more evenly cooked custards that are way harder to mess up. Lastly, I'll give each one of these ramekins a quick poke with a cake tester to let a little bit of the steam escape. Too much and it would drip back into the custard, making them weird on top. Then I'll load this sheet tray into my preheated 215 degree oven and bake for two hours until things are well set, silky, and smooth. Just just like this loungewear from the sponsor of this video, Tommy John. Hey guys, 
Editor Bry here, just editing this video. And when I'm editing, I gotta be comfortable. That's why I put on my very comfortable Tommy John loungewear. I went simple today with this gray crew neck t-shirt and these French Terry joggers. The entire outfit is stretchy and breathable for when I'm editing or lounging at home, but it's also versatile enough to wear to the store for grocery runs. The joggers even have a little zipper pocket in the back for my wallet. I also got this matching lounge Henley and jogger set that you can also get as a t-shirt or shorts. And I'm not joking when I say that this is literally the softest clothing that I've ever worn or owned. And these Tommy John second skin undies that I've been wearing have been a real game changer. I will not be modeling them, but you can see that they're super lightweight and stretchy. Very comfortable. Plus the waistband doesn't dig into my skin, so there's no bunching or riding up when I wear them. So to try Tommy John and to get some soft clothes on your body, click the link in my description and use code BrianL at checkout to get 20% off plus free shipping on orders over 75 bucks. Thank you, Tommy John. After just about two hours of bake time, I'll come back to check on the custards. When I shake the tray, you can see that they're not loose or liquidy on top and look relatively set. So I'll pull them out to take a closer look. Two hours is a general guideline for timing here because when your oven gets as low as this one is, the thermostat can vary in sensitivity. My 215 could be your 240, so I go by I first. As you can see, these look fully set on top, but they've got a little jiggle. That's what I'm looking for. And secondly, I'll go by temperature. Just like for the quiche that I did last week, 170F is the lower end of acceptable for baked eggs, but slightly higher is okay as well. As you can see, this is right around 178 throughout, so I'll call it done. By the way, this custard is pretty bulletproof. I cooked this test batch to 210F, and it was still pretty freaking creamy and delicious once it was cooled and set. Slightly overcooked custard is gonna be way better than slightly undercooked. Also, let's take a quick look at that baking dish custard that we made for a crowd earlier. This set up perfectly just like the four piece did in about two hours even. And after 15 minutes at room temp, I'm gonna throw these fully cooked custards into the fridge to cool and fully set for at least two hours, but preferably more. Overnight is actually the best in my experience. The next day, when I pull these out, you can see that they have set up almost like jello. They're firm, but they're not bouncy like flan or panna cotta. Next, I'll top this with a generous dose of sugar, about three tablespoons, 30 to 40 grams. I'm using sugar in the raw and I'll get into why that is in just a second. For now, I'll fire up my cute little butane torch here and get to work melting and caramelizing the sugar. I'm not gonna lie, most home level torches like the one that I'm using are underpowered compared to the ones that they use at restaurants and torching this sugar to the hardball stage takes a while like three to four minutes per creme brulee. The good thing about sugar in the raw though is that as it sits for three to four minutes, it doesn't melt into the top of the custard. Regular sugar and caster sugar do melt and that makes caramelizing them really difficult. The torch then needs to evaporate the moisture that it absorbed and that ends up cooking the custard more and not caramelizing evenly. And for me, it's just a mess. So I go with sugar in the raw because it takes a long time to melt and it caramelizes super evenly. Also, if you're wondering what to do without a torch, well, the backup move would be to throw your custard directly under a hot broiler. I'll say that this move can work pretty good, but you really have to pay attention. It's pretty hard to get all of the sugar to the hard ball crack stage at the same time, and more often than not, you end up with burnt spots in some areas and under caramelized spots in others. Plus, the custard itself gets rocked pretty hard under the broiler and heats up a little bit more than I like, and then you kind of have a curdled, slightly hot creme brulee experience, and that's not my favorite. I'll throw a link to a cheap torch on Amazon in the description, just in case you want it. And after three minutes of patient torching, I've got a perfectly caramelized sugar crust that's right on the edge of burning in a few places, but not burnt. I love that dark caramel zone right there. The custard inside is like cool, firm vanilla pudding, but it's the richest, creamiest, vanilla-iest pudding you've ever had. Pair that with a dark, crunchy sugar crust and your little human brain just doesn't know what to do. It's maxed out. There is no more pleasure to be had. You guys, this dish is fancy as hell, especially with fresh vanilla beans, but with this no water bath method, it's super easy. That's a really rare combination, and I really think you should try it soon. Let's eat this thing.